Thank you very much, Andreas. And um, I just want to say, yes, a, a thank you to David for a, a, oh, a, a really fascinating talk. Um, and um, yes, very pleased to be, as we're rounding out our, our, our weekend of discussions of, of Vienna after um, a really wide ranging series of discussions by inviting back uh, our, our speakers, um, and um, I can see, I can see, I can't see all of the names in front of me. Let me just adjust my view. Ah, hello, there you are. That's better. Now I can see all of you at once. So it's that kind of, uh, that's like celebrity squares uh, version, which won't, will mean nothing to anybody without a certain kind of uh, background in, uh, in British uh, popular television culture of the well, 1980s, I guess. Um, but thank you all for, thank you all for, for joining us again. And, and I, just want to uh, reintroduce our, our, our speakers very, very briefly, not with formal uh, introductions, but just to welcome back Ruth Hanisch from Dortmund University, uh, Bernadette Reinhold from uh, the University of Applied Arts in Vienna, uh, my two colleagues, uh, Faith Binks and Charles Weffin, both from Bath Spa University, and two of our speakers from today, um, Arif Ahmed from uh, Cambridge University, um, and Stephen Frosch, who uh, both of them were speaking to us about um, uh, Wittgenstein and Freud, respectively, today. Um, thank you all very much. I enjoyed all of your talks tremendously. And uh, I, I, rather than kind of um, subjecting everybody to my questions, what, what I thought would be best to do, given it's been such a stimulating, informative range of talks, and, and our audience here who have contributed uh, massively to the, some fantastic thought-provoking discussions, um, as I said, I'd, I'd like to kick off with just asking your reflections each in turn, just about your thoughts ab ab about about the symposium, about our topic. It might be about the kind of emerging themes or connections that were already being made in the discussion we've just had, of course, and have emerged in the different papers, particularly between your own interests, your own expertise and other talks that you might have uh, 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 listened in on. Um, or perhaps even different ideas or meanings of Vienna during this period, which seem to have come out. Um, and also a kind of question that has been coming up from our audience quite consistently, which is very interesting, and I dare say will lead to further questions. Any echoes of and resonances of that intellectual life of Vienna during this period with our own contemporary European and indeed global situation? Um, so I'm, I'm if you want to speak about one of those, um, touch briefly in the space of five or six minutes on, on all of them. I just wanted to uh, get, your, get your statements and then and I think we'll open it up to our audience um, for what should be another you know, a good 20, 25 minutes of, uh, of, of question and answers and discussion. And um, we'll uh, at that point uh, ask our after each of you had a chance to speak, I'll ask, I'll ask our audience to unmute themselves and uh, turn their cameras back on if you wish. Um, this session is still being recorded, so um, if you don't wish to have your camera turn on, um, uh, then, uh, then that's absolutely fine. Um, please, whilst our speakers are, are talking, feel free to use the chat function to add your questions and things you'd like us to talk about, and we can queue those up if you like. Um, but at this point, I'll, I'll, I'll hand over and I'm just going to be entirely based on what Zoom is showing me right now. So to, to my, where am I? Uh, to, to my left, I'm trying to think about the screen. I've got Ruth. So Ruth, over to you in terms of your, your reflections. Keen thank you very much. Um, thank you for all the panelists. It was very exciting and I, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, what came to my mind in the first place is that we've got this picture of Vienna as this very, very innovative place, even in the 20s and 30s. And for my field of expertise, um, that's actually not the case. Um, in architectural history, we see Vienna's architecture in the 20s and in the 30s as somehow a little bit too tra traditional and almost second rated, which is kind of peculiar. Um, so there was this climax around 1900 with Otto Wagner and Adolf Loos, and then there is supposed to be a decline um, in the field of architecture, which obviously is not true for all the other fil fields we talked about, like literature, 
philosophy, all sorts of music, especially um, painting, etc. It's kind of awkward in a sense, um, especially as, for example, um, a new publication of the diaries of Otto Wagner, his personal diaries um, from, I think, between 1913 and his death in 1918, very clearly shows that he was a rather nasty anti-Semite, which does not fit in altogether in our picture of the modern hero of uh, architecture. Uh, there are some is issues with Adolf Loos <laughs> and his relation to small girls um, as well. So our heroes at the moment are a bit crumbling. Um, and I would like to make the statement that this general notion of a decline is not true. If you look at the architecture from a slightly different angle, and here comes the Vienna Sorte, um, very helpful because one of the most important architects in the 20s is Josef Frank, Joseph Frank, which was the brother of Philipp Frank, the very famous member of the Viennese circle. And he himself took part in some of the dis discussions of the Viennese circle. And he, he, he um, built several um, villas and um, social housing projects in Vienna, not a lot. Um, but he was an active architect and he wrote a lot on modern architecture. And it's quite interesting because he was probably the most intellectual opponent of functionalism in the reading of the Bauhaus. And that's very interesting because it was a left-wing criticism of the Bauhaus and not a conservative criticism. And to Frank, um, form always or ever follows function, as it is said, was something metaphysical in the sense of the Wiener, Vienna circle. You can't prove, for him, it's just a phrase. It's just a belief. What is that supposed to mean? And what he states instead was one can use everything that can be used. So if you can use your old chair that it's not functionalist, um, then obviously you can use it. And it reminds me a lot of Wittgenstein's famous statement, the world is all that is the case. So if you can use it, you can use it. Um, that's a very, I would say very, sounds very simple, but is a very fundamentally different way of reading modern architecture. Um, and I think that it's, this arose in Vienna, first of all, because architects had a slightly different notion to the historic city. Viennese architects never had the idea of te tear down the first district and build something new, like Corbusier did for Paris. They actually liked the historic city, or they loved it even. Um, so there was no, not the idea that you have to, you know, tear down everything to build something new, but it was more a sense of a progression. Yeah. Um, and I think that has to do with the social climate in the city, the sense of continuity and progression paired with being very critical against slogans in a certain way. So that's a bit what, what came out of the conference for me personally. <laughs> um, no, thank you. That's, there's some really interesting connections there that, uh, between, between architecture, between philosophy and, 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 and their political implications as well. I think that's, uh, that's, that's fascinating. Thank you. Um, and I think, yes, I'm already getting, starting to get some questions in the, um, in the chat here, which I'm just keeping, a, keeping track of for, for later. So please everyone keep adding to those. Um, Bernadette, I'll turn to you because you're next on my screen. Um, yeah. Hi, I, hello. Hello, can you hear us okay? So, um, yeah, just, yes, um, really interested to hear your, your reflections. Yeah, uh, first of all, 
best regards from Vienna. So um, I really tried to join most of the talks and um, I learned a lot. And I was questioning, so in addition to that, what Ruth mentioned now, uh, of which, which kind of Vienna we are talking. So there were uh, different places different uh, um, different persons, different uh, activists in a way uh, with different backgrounds. So, um, and I wonder, uh, we very often have uh, some kind of, uh, of a picture of Vienna. Uh, Ruth pointed it out as an innovative uh, uh, field and somehow as a closed field. So but I think there are so many questions and it's also a question of our canons and uh, how we write biographies or monographies about these persons, Freud or Neurath. For example, there is one biography about Otto Neurath uh, in a political sense by Günther Sander, which brings other perspectives uh, to it. And as Ruth mentioned it, uh, about the heroes of architecture. So um, I think it's an open field and it's a very, um, we have to look at it differentiated. So remember Karl Schorske's uh, study from the late uh, 60s, 1960s. And so we have uh, some um, uh, contradictory. So we have, uh, uh, for example, Theodor Herzl in the same city at the same time, like Georg Schönerer and uh, Karl Loega. So these are all figures which uh, were very important for the learning of Adolf Hitler in a way of this uh, these mass party movements. So on the one hand, and to go deep deeper, uh, I was I was really impressed by the talk of Arif in in uh, in the noon afternoon, and I had some thoughts about to go deeper in the in the in the um, in this field. So. Uh, if there is architecture, especially architecture, music, philosophy, and logic, I think these are fields which, which there were, where there was the idea of a, of some kind of construction and a new order. So um, to mention Loos and Wittgenstein and also Anton Weber, and I put it in the chat in the discussion. So I think the highly condensed, so I heard it in the afternoon again, for example, the Opus uh, 6 uh, of Webern from 1909, uh, it, it lasts for about seven minutes, so it is highly condensed, you know, in a way, and it seems completely purified, but it, if you know the story behind it, it is a work which he has composed after the death of his belo very beloved mother. So um, this was the question, also Ruth mentioned it, uh, with Josef Frank and also with Loos. It's some kind of usability. Uh, how can you use architecture, design, furniture, and uh, what kind of impact does music have to us? So it's not to say it's only expression of, of feelings or emotions. It's um, how to, to get a new order. And it's 1909, this composition, but it's it's in the year before the war, the Great War. Mm -hmm. And this was also what, what I've um, had the idea of the symposium that uh, World War First, first was um, very important to this uh, protectionist. So we heard that Wittgenstein, uh, he had bad uh, war uh, experience. And so I, know, I knew it, of course, of Kokoschka, which uh, well, uh, he 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 hardly survived it. So um, this is one thing. And there is one idea, some kind of meta uh, level um, to look at it. So there's Berthold Viertel. He's not very well known. He is uh, nearly the same age as uh, Kokoschka, so in 19, 1890 uh, born. And he was a writer and a theater man. And Remembering in some autobiographical uh, fragments uh, after World War II, he had some memory of rememberings of uh, modern Vienna, uh, Viennese modernism. And he has some kind of theory of fathers and sons. So 
Uh, and I go back to your talk, Richard, uh, also of uh, Stefan Zweig, when he talks about the world of his father's or his father or his father's world. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, um, but in the meaning of, of Bertolt Viertel, it is said that fathers is not only the traditional one, there are father figures and son figures. So fathers, uh, for him, for example, is also Freud, who made a lot of pupils, as we know, and the sons are the revolutionaries. So of course, like Kokoschka, but also Wittgenstein. And, um, so a figure of, uh, Schoenberg, for example, is for him a father and a son. So it's, it's also how we think about generation in this. So it's not the same Vienna when we're talking about 1900 or, of course, uh, after World War One. So, um, and I think if we are talking about fathers and sons, we, we, we now we have the view of the daughters of the mothers. So, and there was in a way also, I didn't know the authors. Um, I, uh, it was good to hear the talk of faith about these two British authors. So I think it's our work now to discover the, the female architects. Ruth mentioned, for example, Schutte uh, or Ella Briggs and, and there are others. And I think it's also our duty <laughs> not to tell it as a narrative of victimness. Uh, so, but, um, to see that there must, was much more power also in this female field. So, uh, I think I, I can talk, of course, a lot about Kokoschka, but, uh, and also Schoenberg. I think these were very male egos and in a way there were some narcissistic, uh, or more or less or more narcissistic, um, um yes uh, points in their in their work in their life in their behaving and yeah and we could talk about Bourdieu uh, about what kind of field culture means if it's a closed field or an open field and where are crossings and so I think it's an open story in a way <laughs> I hope that wasn't too confusing it, it, there's a whole, yes, a whole series of connections emerging in there, particularly in relationship to, as you said, um, the, the differences generationally um, and also all the other kind of cultural uh, and, and, and other differences which cut across and provide very different uh, perspectives, I think. And, and since you mentioned faith, uh, faith is coincidentally next in my um, uh, clockwise sweep of my screen. So um, you're, that's a cue for you, faith. It is. That's a good segue, Richard. Um, yes, thanks to everyone. I have learned a lot, uh, a lot this weekend. It's been fantastic. Um, we've, I think Bernadette was using a moment ago that idea of the crossroads, and this is a word which actually appears in Mary Butt's story about Vienna. Um, she talks about it as, as a crossroads, as a crossroads twice. You know, it's both a crossroads historically within Central Europe, and she also uses the word crucifixion to talk about the relationship between crucifixion and delight within Vienna. And obviously the, the moment in the city that she's remembering, or she's writing about rather, is a, a moment of intense suffering. It's a real crisis. And both of the texts that I was looking at are very focused on that. You know, that none of the big names, none of the great buildings, or if the great buildings are standing, then they've been renamed and repurposed as hotels for the Inter-Allied Commission. Um, there's, there's a real sense that all of those monuments of Vienna in terms of their actual sort of physical existence within the text have been transformed completely. But of course, that doesn't mean to say that they're absent. In fact, actually, maybe they're even more present because they're imagined. Um, it, it goes back to uh, a point that Ruth was making about this idea of, of kind of, well, how do you view the architecture at this moment? And I'm not an expert in Viennese architecture in any way, but I was thinking also about this idea of a sort of geometry of place that seems to emerge um, through the, through the musicality, you know, Charles talk about music, through this idea of the circle, through this idea of the crossroads, uh, even through some of the works which appear sort of artistically, obviously not the sort of more expressionist, uh, work that Kokoschka is doing, but, but still as a sort of theme. Um, and I think that idea of woven layers, which, in which contradictory is kind of absolutely coexist with one another, and it's our job as scholars or as, um, 
as kind of makers and consumers of culture to think about the relationships between those layers. But note that the days when anyone had an authority over how to interpret those absolutely, certainly in the, certainly in the stories that I was working on, uh, has gone. And I think the, the, the kind of the opportunities that opens up exactly in terms of thinking about untold narratives and their places within the texture of such a great city. Um, and that idea of, of, of the kind of danger and the opportunity of crossroads, I suppose that's another thing that particularly the Jean Rees story that I was talking about, um, particularly the 1927 version, the second version is all about, it's about people fleeing through a landscape that's almost changing in front of their very eyes. And as strangers, they really only sense kind of after they pass through something, what they've just seen and they, they don't interpret it correctly until a while later. I feel the kind of impossibility of knowing your historical moment is, is one of the things that Vienna uh, has, a, a, has a really important lesson to teach us all about. But maybe the lesson is that you can't learn the lesson <laughs> until it's too late. I don't, I don't know. Um, and it feels as though to me that idea about conversations around Europe, around European identity, around where culture lives, whose ownership of it uh, should we respect? You know, how, how should we hear voices? How should we tell those stories? I mean, these are all massive questions that provoke, they preoccupy not just Viennese artists and writers of this period, but maybe all writers and, and artists. Um, but yeah, that's all, that's all buzzing around in, in my head, I guess, after this weekend. Um, and yes, the people will have very different answers to those problems, I guess, depending on who they work on. But no, I've learned a lot. It's been an immense pleasure. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Faith. And so really, yeah, I love your point there about the, uh, the kind of geometry of place and the way in which that is that 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 kind of seems to cross genres and it cross disciplines and it's in some really interesting ways picking up on the idea of you know musical or the the, the, the kind of geometrical kind of uh, structures of, of of crossroads of circles and um the ways and your moment the the, the point you made about being the potential impossibility of knowing your own historical moment of being able to step outside of that um is something that obviously uh, universally applicable, but um, something, something we've seen it in a lot of different ways in these in the in these papers. So, um, what I've noticed is that Zoom, in in, in the way of all um, uh, uh, automated um, uh, uh, mediating devices, has automatically shifted and shuffled you around my screen. So my my careful method of uh, moving cl clockwise around the screen has now been thrown completely out. But I do remember that it, um, Stephen, you were you had been appearing next to Faith. You're still next to her, and and then um, uh, I'll, I'll be great to hear from you on that on on your reflections first, and then uh, Arif, and then Charles. Oh, Stephen, I think you you need your uh, mic just to be turned on. Thank, uh, thanks very much. Can you hear me now? Absolutely, yes. No, I didn't manage to get to, to many of the talks, so I'm really sorry about that. But um, what I did hear was really great. And also the comments just now I thought were pretty brilliant, really. So I now feel intimidated. Um, what, what, what I wanted to so I've, I've just got, a kind of, I think, three or four short points, I hope, which which link with the question of the, the nouns of the Vienna of the then. And it's a kind of, um, that itself is a kind of psychoanalytic perception, what uh, Freud called Nachtreglichkeit, the way in which the things that come back from the past haunt us in the present, and the way in which the experience that we have now in the present change the way in which we think about the past. That is, that the past is always in the present, and the present is always, is always we always read the past through the present, um, which itself is a kind of statement about haunting, which I think was um, may have been one of the words that was just used. Um, that is, that, that things that we think have gone keep coming back, often shocking us. But the there's, there's things that, from what I heard, that I, I get most interested in me, uh, I suppose there's um, three or possibly four of them. Um, maybe a quick word about Freud that is interesting in relation to all this, the talk about modernity and how psychoanalysis marks a certain moment in modernity and how his publication, I emphasise, The Interpretation of Dreams, is, is a kind of founding um, rock of the 20th century, published you know, technically, supposedly in 1900. Um, uh, nevertheless, Freud was, was really traditional in himself, in his being. Mm -hmm. And I think that this tension that you see all the time between something which is around kind of continuity, even a nostalgia for a certain kind of imagined past, 
And the disruption that that moment of imagining does to the present is really there in psychoanalysis. And perhaps that's a, something about the turbulence of that time in Vienna as well. Um, but anyway, here's my short points, I think. Firstly, uh, I think there's been a conversation going on about logic and ethics. And um, the question which comes up partly through, uh, I suppose, Wittgenstein, um, but about, uh, and, 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 the, and also the Vienna Circle, that about whether we should think about logic as ethics, that it is ethical to pare away all the nonsense, really, to look for something which one might call the truth, or whether we think of logic as somehow opposed to ethics, that it reduces the complexity of relationality that we have when we confront other people and misses so much of what goes on in the interchange that we have with others, all those things which somehow feel real and yet are not so easy to reduce to logical statements. And I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not actually choosing between those things because I can certainly understand the argument that runs that logic, logic is ethics. There's an interesting thing in psychoanalysis. There's a, there's a lot of criticism comes from the French school and from others and from critical theorists themselves about what happened to psychoanalysis when it moved to America after the Second World War and what came to be known as ego psychology, which very briefly is an understanding that the purpose of psychoanalysis is to strengthen the ego so that it can control the unconscious. And um, the criticism is this leads to a kind of conformity in which, the, in which what we really need is, 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 is to master ourselves in line with the expectations placed on us by a social world. And I think that's true, but there's another side to this, which is that the people who, who invented this kind of ego psychology had fled the madness and barbarism and irrationality of Europe. So for them, it was really important to have a kind of uh, approach to psychoanalysis which emphasised the, the significance of rational control. They'd, they'd learned what it's like to allow rationality to, to um, dominate. And that is, is my second point, I think, which is, is this question of the rational. I think uh, what psychoanalysis of the time of what Freud really showed is just how what we take to be rational is, is itself based on what we normally describe as irrational. And that to try and split these things off from one another is actually a kind of colonial enterprise, indeed colonialism itself. Indeed, are we looking at a picture of Bath behind you? Richard, what are we looking at? Oh, Vienna. No, I don't know what we're looking at. Can't hear you. No, sorry, I've just, um, I'm, I've just turned my mic off. So, no, this is uh, Vienna. It's the sky. Yeah, Vienna. OK, sorry. well, I was thinking about Bath, which is, uh, as we know, a beautiful, beautiful city. Uh, all the facades look fantastic. And, it, you know, when it's not COVID time, it packs in tourists. But behind all these facades is slavery. Behind this beautiful surface, behind this rugby, even this formal surface of Bath is slavery. That's what built it. That's where the money comes from. And um, that is a, a really, although that's not a perception of psychoanalysis, that's a perception of decolonialism and postcolonialism. It is so much in line with the psychoanalytic perspective that where we think we are at our most civilised, so we are so disturbed by what is, is destructive and irrational. Barbarism lurks in the heart of civilization as, as the Great War that was referred to before um, demonstrated as, of course, did the rise of Nazism at the end of the period we're talking about. Um, that seems to me to be a psychoanalytic repost to the possibility of having a totally rational um, philosophy. Um, the third thing I wanted to say is about uh, uh, something that came up in, in, uh, after my talk, which is about the repetition of anxiety. And I think um, one of the things that we've seen in the last year around COVID is the question about what it means to feel uh, a mixture of anxiety and loss and also um, the, around that also the significance of, of the interpersonal as well. Um, for some people, COVID has been a relief. You don't have to connect with other people. But most people, I think it's been a hugely stressful, anxiety-provoking time precisely because um, the others from out of whom we forge ourselves uh, and, uh, only exist in this disembodied way. I was very impressed this week. I had a student telling me that she's um, she had her first child a year ago and this baby is now a year old. And she feels like she's never become a mother because nobody's been able to recognise her as such. Um, because of the experience of not being able to be out in the world with this new baby of hers. 
And uh, it seems to me there's a real truth in that, uh, which is about, uh, again, a psychoanalytic truth about the degree to which ourselves are forged by our relationality. My final point, I think, oh, so much you could say, really. But anyway, my final point for now, because it's so long, is, is, is about um, uh, the, the, the um, echoes of the period we talked about. Uh, Vienna, as we, I was saying a lot, and I think it's come up again, was absolutely... Um, um, uh, immersed in anti-Semitism and was crucible for anti-Semitism, was more anti-Semitic than even uh, Germany once it came to Nazi times. And that anti-Semitism was a very profound influence on the early psychoanalytic movement. And I dare, dare say on the um, other people who, 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 these, who the, my expert colleagues have been talking about so beautifully. And now, too, we have an environment in which we've seen a resurgence, actually, of anti-Semitism, but more broadly of, of racism. We've seen the continuities of racism. We've seen the way, for example, in which we live in, uh, to quote a famous, now famous book, in the wake of slavery, that which means awake that continues. We are still awake. Slavery continues today, and that's what the Black Lives Matter movement has been telling us. And I think uh, one of the echoes we have of that time and today is that this really surfaced uh, it's a kind of warning, of course, it's a warning about what might happen if we don't take this seriously. And it's also um, a statement about the exact um, contortions and complexities of an environment that gives rise to this creativity um, that we, we, you know, as well as to the, uh, it's dark underside as well. Thank you, Steve. Um, yeah, for those, for those reflections, lots of, lots of connections that are going on there. As you said, you, you brought us right up to date as well. Um, Arif, you, you're you are next on my screen, and in in, in my order, I'd, I'd like to hand over to you for your for your reflections. Great, thank you so much, and thank you very much to everyone, um, everyone here. I learned so much from the few talks that I could I was able to attend, um, and also to the to the audience for their brilliant questions. Um, so I think I'll just make three or four points, picking up on some of the things that I've heard today. Um, so the first one, actually, just just to respond to something that, that Stephen Potter just now, I think he's quite right to distinguish between two ways to think about logic and ethics um, so that you can think that logic is, as Wittgenstein evidently did, a sort of ethical endeavour, um, whilst also being alive to the ethical perils of logic. And of, I wouldn't say taking it too seriously, but allowing it to affect parts of your life you know, in ways that it shouldn't be, for instance, in the personal relationships. Um, uh, Wittgenstein's own life, of course, his, his own interpersonal relationship being notoriously strained or bad or mishandled by himself or involved serious misjudgments um, in various ways. Um, but I think in principle, at least, one can, one can appreciate both the, the, the sort of ethical potential and also the ethical perils of the sort of logical inquiry mm. had in mind. Um, and a second related point, which connects also to something that, that Stephen said, was to do with, with rationality and the sort of irrational underpinnings, you know, that lies beneath what seems to be a rational society that we live in. And of course, Wittgenstein himself was alive to that much more in his later work than he was in his earlier work. And there, there we see a vision of a, of a world in which even what seems like the paradigms of rationality, logic itself, are driven by a kind of blind, almost animal response to stimuli and so on. And I would say, if you read his work, you would think the psychological influences of him were more Skinner than Freud, actually, if you read his mm. investigations. But you do get that, that sense in, in, in his later work. Um, because I want to pick up on something that, that Ruth said, which seems to me to be right, which is the, the connection between the sort of functionist way of thinking in architecture and Wittgenstein's own sort of dis distinction between facts and values in, in the Tractatus. Um, and I think that maybe connects to some of the things that other people have been saying in Vienna before. For instance, and the person I was thinking of was, was Karl Krauss, I guess, who was, you know, was very critical of the way in which, for instance, newspapers and news reporters you know, went about their job when they mixed the unvarnished reporting of facts, which is one thing that news can do, with the sort of opinions and, and um, emotional responses and so on, which are a separate a separate issue, perhaps not something uh, you know suitable for the fact stated language that ultimately Wittgenstein himself was, was concerned to analyze. And then the last thing I think I think I'll, I'll, I'll let other people speak. So I'll just mention one other thing briefly, which is to pick up on something that David Evans 
mentioned in his talk, which interested me, and this connects also with your question, Richard, about some of the modern relevance of this, um, which is something that we find in the Vienna Circle and also to some extent of Wittgenstein, who, who also had a philosophical inheritance from Kierkegaard, I mean, a very important one, and one that I didn't really mention in my, in my talk, um, which is their deep individualism um, and their deep sort of commitment to the idea that the locus of value is not society or the group, or the race, or the people, or the bulk, or the Reich, but it's the individual, and he's the, the locus of all value. Um, and that was something that we found in, in the Vienna Circle as well, and it was a mode by which it opposed the nationalism, the kind of nationalism that, that you know, was, was sweeping Austria at the time. And I think there's a lesson for us to be learned today, and maybe not everyone will agree with me here, but I think things like identity politics, for instance, are dangerous. Um, uh, movement um, and can result in confusion and misunderstanding. I think we should remember that we are all individuals and we're not defined by the groups that we belong to, um, but we all have a separate existence right. from those groups and we have our own responsibility to ourselves independently of the society that we live in. Right. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, no, thanks, Eric. That, that's uh, yeah, um, some fantastic, uh, really thoughtful reflections and bringing things together. I'm, I'm, I was going to even resist um, the, the, your point about we're all being individuals to uh, reply, I'm not a la Monty Python. And I, I just simply couldn't resist. So uh, but it's a really important question to raise about you know, the relationship between individuals and the fact that what we spent so much time talking about uh, over these couple of days are, are societies, circles, communities of those individuals and, and whether there's a kind of another kind of thinking of community that's going on in, in some of these instances as well. It came through very much, very clearly in, uh, in, in yes, David's talk uh, and Stephen's talk earlier today. Um, but uh, Charles, uh, last but not least, I'd like to hand over to you actually to get your, your thoughts and reflections on, on how we might make connections one way or the other um, with the, the topics we've been talking about. Thank you, Richard, and, and thank you to everybody. It, it's been a really stimulating couple of days. And I'm, I am tempted to make certain connections. And, and I, I, when, I, when I sat down tonight, that, that, was, that was definitely at the, the front of my, at the top of my list. Um, however, I'm also struck by some of the contradictions that, that we're identifying here as well. And, um, Arif, I, I was fascinated by what you had to say a moment ago about the significance of the individual. And, and certainly that speaks to my understanding of, of some of the music that we've been talking about over the last few days. And, and in fact, some of the music we didn't talk about as well. Um, and of course, links us back to, to, um, psychoanalysis and, and, and to, to, um, I suppose, a, a, a quality of introspection and, and, and certainly um, a, a number of people have, have referred to, to uh, pieces like um, Erwartung and, 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 and Piero Lunaire, um, which, which really do focus in on the individual, but through different prisms, different lenses. So, so I suppose, you know, Piero Lunaire through, 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 through symbolism, through symbolist poetry and, and, um, uh, but in other in other ways through through sort of expressionist um, lenses, but I'm struck by the contradiction between that and some of the societies that we've been talking about, um, which are very self consciously organised, as far as I can see. So I'm thinking here about the the, the secessionists. I suppose um, I spoke last night about um, Schoenberg's. Society for the performance of uh, for the private performance of music. Um, we heard today about the Wednesday Society, which I hadn't been aware of. I must admit, um, uh, of, of, of Freud, and and of course about the Vienna Circle, and and the, the, there seems to be something. There seems to be an element of of as I say, uh, organization and and uh, to a certain degree exclusivity involved in in those groupings of of people um i, I I'm, I'm also struck by by some of the contradictions and and i suppose this is always the case but the contradictions inherent in modernism around the the the, the desire to be 
somehow some kind of iconoclast and 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 to to sweep the old away and to come in with with new modes of thinking new new ideas new structures and um, new ways of working and 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 of course we we've we've discussed some of that over the last couple of days um but on the other hand here we are talking about utilitarian functions um potentially for 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 art and architecture and and indeed i guess um music and literature to some extent and um we're also um talking or, or certainly I, I i was talking about references back to to previous styles to previous forms um and and in in my own case i guess the thing that fascinates me is that these uh these the these these sort of princes of modernism that, that you know schoenberg and weber and and, and berg um spent quite a lot of their professional lives referring back to existing music by by making new arrangements of it or orchestrations of it and and so on um so to me that is a that that is an interesting um contradiction and and this idea of of perhaps a, a kind of palimpsest um and and so although i i appreciate that that yes, the, the logical empiricists uh, rejected um, rejected metaphysics and rejected that that attachment to the soil and and, and so on. Um, on the other hand, it, it it seems that we 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 can't escape our past, and and that seems to have been a a theme running through the the the, the, the last two days for me, at any rate. Um, and the the other point that I I wanted to to raise was a question that was going through my head today about um, what it was, and, it, and it, in some respects, this is a really obvious question. So, so I apologise for raising it. But what was it about the art, the architecture? Well, not so architecture so much, perhaps, but the certainly the art and and, and literature and, and music that that was so threatening to to fascism. And 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 I do I do appreciate that there possibly some of this does come back to to the power of the the, the individual and that um, being threatened by something that, that that perhaps is is abstract um, perhaps being threatened by by some kind of internal logic um, certainly in, in, in music by being threatened by something that is not tonal that is not necessarily easily accessible um so uh, you know as as we move into the 30s and and we had specific um uh specific people specific bodies of work being being regarded as as degenerate um by by the the the, the nazi authorities um th that that to me is 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 quite remarkable particularly as, as I think we've all accepted that, that there were some of these uh, strands of, of um, continuity. And I, in my own case, last night I was talking about the, the continuity to some extent, at any rate, from Wagner and, and, and Mahler into, in, in, into the work of Schoenberg um, and through Berg and, and, and so on. And yet Wozzeck and Lulu were, were you know outrageous and 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 were were, were banned from um from 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 austria and germany in, in in the 1930s so so how did we get to that position and i guess you know the implication of that is 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 how can we stop this happening again and and i've been really interested in in, in the comments that i've picked up in the chat from from people who who do see parallels with uh with, with with some of the recent developments that that, that that we've been talking about in the world, so so um, that, that was a bit of a rambling, uh, um, a, a rambling statement, Richard. But but thank you. Uh, not rambling at all, uh, Charles, and and really valuable. I like your attention to to bringing out teasing out contradictions here, um, and that that what 
once again, that question that keeps emerging, what was so threatening about these artists, these thinkers, these movements to, um, as it were, the, even when they were relatively apolitical to, to fascism, to the emergence of totalitarian regimes. Uh, and I, it also links, I think, very interestingly to Arif's point about the individual. Um, reminds me that uh, in, her, in her Origins of Totalitarianism, Hannah Arendt in 1951, a work that has been much rediscovered since the uh, Trump, in the Trump era, if we might call it that, um, for her totalitarian power was predicated on the superfluousness of the individual of totalitarian power as a kind of nihilistic project and um so there is something i think very much in that it links i think possibly to our first question i want to open that up and thank you all actually for such thoughtful um synthetic um ways of bringing bringing everything together actually yes you walk out right joe i think perhaps a little round of applause just a, a final round of applause from everybody for our for our speakers and particularly for that wonderful summation and you know, Connections. Thank you. Um, I, I I wanted to turn it over. We've we've got about quarter, just over quarter of an hour um, of our of our discussion and panel time. Uh, and, and I dare say that different uh, different members of the panel will have thoughts about what each one of you have said. And I, I'm very much grateful for the ways in which you kind of already laid a trail of breadcrumbs of topics to think about. Some questions that emerged um, already in response to what you've said. Um, there's a first one from, I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't know your name, but it's, it's iPad uh, is, your, is your designation, um, which is, uh, you know, might be corporate sponsorship, I'm not sure. Um, but <laughs> this idea of- No, it's my technical inability to <laughs> add oh. on a name. <laughs> sorry, so what sorry. is your name? I don't know it. It's Dipali. Dipali, thank you very much for this question. And um, did you did you want to ask it, or do you want me to read it out? Yes, please, if you wouldn't mind reading it out. Do that. So, so Dipali's interested in the rise of resentment to what the Vienna Circle stood for. Very much the, the topic of David's talk, and we've picked up in a number of different ways, um, and which, as she puts it, you know, seems to discount feelings, but itself gives rise to the feeling of. Um, uh, if I've repression understood. sorry sorry oh so yes it gives I, I was relating it to an earlier talk uh, where uh, you know the, the question came up i think it was in the talk on freud of repression yes. and how repression leads to revolution because yes. uh, yes, you're trying to an expressionism the was the th yes, key thing exactly. you, know, you were expressing your resentment and uh, the vienna circles um sort of um, what shall I say, a dumping of feelings in turn caused this feeling of resentment and perhaps gave oh. rise to what happened in the Second World War, you know, the oh. rise of Nazism. Oh. Okay, I think, I, 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 you know, thank you for that. I, I think we're, we're, we're not quite, you know, tracing a kind of causal link between this group of people and the causes of the Second World War, but rather the question here is about, um, is there a risk here in discounting feeling? Is there a, a link here, perhaps, or if yeah. you want to jump in on this in terms of um, debates that have taken place mm. in response to, uh, to that group around um, the risks of discounting feeling? I don't know whether that... Yes, is, that, that, you've that, summa that, summarised it very well. Thank you very does much. It, does it have kind of, um, were there kind of further kind of political implications of that? I, I, how would you like to respond to that? And I think obviously, Stephen, insofar as uh, I, I think it might come back to something that you were talking about as well. But Arif, um, I don't know whether you're, in terms of thinking about logical positivists and their philosophical outlook, um, does that strike you as being a, 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 a fair point in terms of thinking about that or not? Well, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's, I think it's probably a stretch to say that there was a causal connection between the things that that, that Carnap was saying, for instance, and, and and the rise of the Third Reich or the Second World, the Second World War. But I do appreciate the, the thought behind the question. And I think the right thing to say about the logical positive is, of course, they sharply distinguished between between thoughts and feelings, um, and that's a distinction we always do well to remember, because of course. We should remember that your feelings don't necessarily correspond to anything in reality at all. I mean, if you don't like something, it doesn't mean there's anything objectively bad about it. And if you like something and someone else doesn't, it doesn't mean either of you made a mistake about anything. It's just a matter of, of one person likes it 
and the other person doesn't. And it's possible, you know, to, to um, and that actually that idea extends in the hands of the logical positivists much further than you'd think. So even disagreements about quite fundamental things, um, people can, people can um, uh, rationally disagree. And of course, that's a total break from the idea of someone like Plato, okay? You know, he thought, he thought that you know, a rational person, you know, there's only one set of ends that a rational person can have, only one kind of aim that a rational person can care about. Um, and so there's a certain, there's an amount, it's kind of liberalism and tolerance, I think, that's associated with that distinction between facts and feelings. That's something I would regard as positive about it, um, uh, rather than threatening or dangerous. On the other hand, um, no doubt it also does give rise to, to various kinds of monsters, one way or the other. However, I do still think that the sharp separation of reality and, and feelings is our best defense, one of our best defenses yeah. against demagoguery. No, thanks. No, th thanks for that. A, a, a sharp defense. Yes, a sharp distinction is a good defense, but also quite a difficult one to achieve. I think, that, yeah, that's 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 the task, as I as I think David was pointing out earlier. Stephen, I don't know whether you. Two yeah, have, I mean, I'm in, I'm in a lot of actually. It surprises me slightly because I'm coming from different places completely, but I'm in a lot of agreement with Arif <laughs> on on this. I think, um, and also I just want to add, I'm tremendously interested in the way in which Wittgenstein is so. Uh, influential on contemporary thoughts about the ordinary, particularly in anthropology. So this really, really interesting work that's come up on, around, uh, well, everything relating to that, but, but that's another topic. I mean, I think on this question, though, we should notice, first of all, that the Nazis directly mobilized feeling. That was that was very much their, 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 their process. And so anything, uh, and so anything which causes a kind of interruption between um, if you like the um, Nazi ideology and the and and uh, a feeling that is then mobilised in a certain direction by it is 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 to be opposed, and psychoanalysis is opposed then on on at least two grounds uh, by the Nazis. One, one is simply it's seen as Jewish science that originated with Jews and so on. It emphasises sexuality and is seen as somehow de degenerating in relation to to the folk to the people. But also uh, this relates to what I think um, I was saying. Because um, psychoanalysis always, uh, at least Freudian psychoanalysis, always had as part of its understanding an opposition between the individual and the demands of society. So a reason for repression, for example, would be that society couldn't cope with the unfettered release of, 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 of unconscious urges. And, and that idea of an opposition was, was antagonistic to the Nazi view that um, what you could, what you should be aiming for is, to, uh, as I said, to mobilize the individual and the individual's unconscious, even this was where Jung came in, as a kind of pro-Nazi, at least for a period. Uh, you could mobilize the unconscious uh, in the service of the folk and of the state. So there's a kind of uh, way in which the unconscious can be mobilized to um, uh, seeds to differ differentiate individuals from one another, people become part of a mass and it's neurotic not to be part of that mass. And so psychotherapy in the German, in, in the Nazi period is aimed at freeing people from their neurotic inhibitions so that they can therefore lose their individuality in the mass. It's very complicated and, and interesting. I mean, I, I do though, I, I think, um, so part of the opposition to psychoanalysis is that psychoanalysis is not just about the expression of feeling, not at all. It certainly doesn't celebrate irrationality at least in Freudian view, it's about the capacity to reflect on that. And, and hence, it's a critical practice in the eyes of the Nazis, because once you reflect on, on the inaccuracy of your feeling, which again is where I'm in line with Arif, with the unreliability of feeling, I mean, one thing psychoanalysis shows us is that you can't trust your feeling. You absolutely can't. So to say, I feel this, therefore it's true, is exactly the opposite of psychoanalysis. It's the moment of reflection on that, which allows you to start thinking, what does this feeling mean that psychoanalysis is pushing towards? And that's exactly what the Nazis didn't want. Finally, um, I just want to note that it's all very complicated because for example, Freud from early on had a critical view of society uh, and thought society damaged the individual, it's true, but he also had a version of, of uh, a trauma theory which understood the individual as constructed by the social. And in his own political thinking about psychoanalysis, he was also social democratic, as shown, for example, by 19, the 1918 um, talk he gave to the uh, International Psychoanalytic Association meeting in Budapest, where he talks about the damage done to poor people by the conditions under which they live and the need to set up um, clinics which would make it possible for everybody to have the fruits of psychoanalysis. And indeed, that did lead to a free clinic movement in Berlin, in Vienna, in Budapest, and in London. 
uh, aimed at aimed at, at not at reconciling people to their lot, but at actually helping people in resisting their lot through feeling more, um, uh, yeah, through through being released from from neurotic anxiety. Thank you, Stephen. That, that's yeah, it's a really interesting connection. And thank you, Dipali, for that question because it's brought out I think yeah. some really interesting and perhaps even surprising kind of connections between uh, and, and parallels between these thinkers. Um, Rather than opening that question up to all of the, the panel colleagues, so we, we won't get to all the questions, I wanted to move us on to the next one, because I think it picks up perhaps a bit on what Stephen was just saying about Freud's kind of social, social democrat views and this, uh, the, the question of the kind of politics of Vienna. Um, Eric has asked us, uh, first of all, saying thank you all for such an informative, enjoyable symposium. To what extent is it fair to say that Vienna was an island of liberalism in a sea of illiberalism? Or perhaps, he worries, perhaps liberalism might not even be the, the right word here or the right way of looking at it. Um, I wanted to open that out uh, to, to everybody. I did wonder whether, um, in terms of the kinds of topics you've been talking about, I wonder whether Ruth and Bernadette, you had particular thoughts about that. So I, I'd, I'd give you, as it were, first bite at this one. Yeah, maybe just... A short note, I mean, the situation of Vienna after the World, World War was very, very peculiar because it was the capital city of nothing. It had the same size as the monarchy and no hinterland, <laughs> or however you would want to call it. So the provinces that remained were relatively poor. They had no industry. It was mainly agricultural. There was no other big city I mean, apart from Graz and Salzburg, but you wouldn't ca call that a city. So all the connections were gone yeah. um, in a way. And they had really, and I think you, you have to appreciate that, they had to reinvent themselves without any economic background. It was a bit, one forgets, but it was not even an independent state as we know it, it was much like Greece in relation to the European Union. They couldn't decide on their budget, they couldn't. Um, so I think in front of that background, it's even more astonishing how well Vienna did as a, as a, as a cultural hotspot still in the 20s and 30s, which was obviously much due to, to the social democrat municipal city council. Um, but on the other hand, this might explain a bit of this rise of um, nationalism because for the um, provinces, Vienna seemed like an alien. This had not a lot to do. So all the other countries were uh, Christ Democrats, so conservative, rural, very Catholic, um, there was no other religion but Catholicism. Um, <laughs> um, so there was a big divide culturally, culturally, economically between Vienna and the rest of Austria, just to <laughs> make a bottom line. Okay, Bernadette. Yeah. Yeah, over to you, Bernadette. Thank you. Yeah, I, wa I want, there is a question, was a question in the, in the chat about liberalism and about the, the, the crash in 1873. Yeah. There were the big, uh, uh, world fair and we had cholera in Vienna and so on. So I think, uh, the, the great times of liberalism of the liberal party. So in parliament, uh, came to an end around 1900 uh, with the rise of uh, the uh, Christian social and uh, highly anti-Semitic uh, Luega, Karl Luega, and uh, it took a couple of years when the Emperor Franz Josef uh, really gave him uh, the license to be the mayor of the city. So I think... Uh, there are also because uh, Stephen uh, uh, mentioned it uh, before, so there are some different kinds of anti-Semitisms. So, um, uh, of course, it has to do with the otherness, and I think the theories of racism and eugenic and all these uh, these this issues uh, had been had been developed in the same time. So. Uh, this for 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 that so um and we had the discussion so it fine to an end 
the, the liberalism. It wasn't an island in a way. But uh, we have to consider that, uh, as Ruth mentioned it, that we had uh, not a unification as it was in Germany in 1871. So it was a multi-ethnical state with very different languages, very different religions. And in a way, I think it worked well. Uh, but the tension, it was some kind of century uh force of nationalism of becoming a nation but which nation a german nation no it's it's it, it has been so different so uh i i think all these these uh discussion of discourses were very important in this time and then you have a figure like luega uh who Yes, a very popular uh, figure. So this on the one hand. And on the other hand, I think uh, Charles pointed it out. There was this misunderstanding of art, the fear of art of the, of the Nazis, uh, but before. So uh, what does modern art, modern music tell us? So, and we have to consider that Adolf Hitler had a very special definition of uh, of art, which, deri which derives from a special sense of beauty, and beauty has to be eternal. So art has not to be some kind of uh, mo mode or fashion in a way that is changing. And I think it has to, to do with a, with a great fear and a fear of loss, so we can connect it, of course, to Freud and a lot of aggression under it, not to understand what is going on. So we're in the time of a highly industrialized uh, situation uh, where a lot of women were working, but were not allowed from the, from the concept of a, of a bourgeois uh, woman. So there are so many contradictions at the same time. And there, as Ruth told it, told it before, uh, Austria was, uh, was loser of the war and uh so there was a great desire of healing i would i would point it out uh, to this and so the music of schoenberg weber and albanberg uh and also the art of kokoschka um they uh they couldn't uh, come over it so also the art of Gustav Klimt in a way where you you can find some traces of beautiness which in a way sticks uh, with the idea of the national socialist in a way so um but the topics were strange so it uh, the, the 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 issues which were um carried out in 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 modern art so i think it has to do a lot with fear and loss and that's that that makes you aggressive in a way so that's that's a very simple uh uh, uh, uh argument in a way but i think um it goes together with that was carried on and i think the anti-semitism of course was after world war second <laughs> not not less absolutely not and so it was uh it was not really a problem for Kokoschka, who was not Jewish, to be invited to come back. Of course, nobody of his artist uh, congruence wanted him back in a way. But it was really a problem to to uh, to call Schoenberg back. Yeah? Who who needs a Jews? Yeah. So uh, and with this music, sorry to to point it this this way out, and um, and in a way. <laughs> you know the develop uh development political development of Austria in the last few years or, or twenty years has been very uh yeah very very um uh, exciting and and with ups and downs and um but I think we have at the reason, at the moment now we have a a high uh development of anti semitism again. And it goes together with an anti-Islam Islam, uh, discussion. And yesterday there was a big uh, uh, protest from the, how do I say, anti-corona, uh, the corona verweigerer, so people who didn't want, uh, do not want to, to, to have the restrictions of the government. And so, and it goes together. You, it's, it's, it's some kind of confusion of 
fear and aggression again. So I think this was written in the chat. What 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 are comparable things from this time uh, to nowadays? And I think uh, it's it's a time of change, and that was. That was the point. It was around 1900 and after World War One. So um, we really have to be aware of <laughs> uh, of our language in a way, also how to speak about this. No, thank you very much, Bernadette. Um, it's it fascinating actually to get that glimpse into contemporary Austrian society and politics as well. And um, I'm a little bit aware of the, the kind of legacies in post-war Austrian literature. So writers like Thomas Bernhardt, who you know, kind of a, a visceral critic of his, of his own country in terms of its, uh, its own past and its, its attempts to forget. Um, so I, I think that's, uh, that's really interesting about the link, picking up on the other question that's been asked about how language um, and language and division as a way of um, both, uh, causing, um, preserving, um, and establishing, cementing divisions socially is, is really important. Um, we are at just three minutes past seven. Um, I, I, I did want to get a couple of these questions in, but I might, I might kind of be brutal and combine them. And I'm aware that a couple of colleagues on the panel haven't had a chance to respond to questions. Um, I, I wanted to pick up on um, the, th there's a question here about uh, creativity and chaos, which speaks across so many of the things you've just been talking about, uh, Bernadette, and 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 throughout the throughout the papers, um, that um, it, it's framed here by Nick in terms of a question about Vienna's reputation in the twenties, um, challenged, perhaps even overshadowed by Berlin's. Um, and we may have some comments on that, perhaps musically, aesthetically, uh, in terms of literature. Um, but also, I think this general point about um, creativity emerging out of chaos, it's the, 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 the productivity and the risks of that. Um, I wondered whether, uh, insofar as Faith and Charles, you've not yet had a chance to respond to any of these questions. Um, I wondered whether you wanted to, this one attracted you at all in terms of thinking about that. Um, th there's also a question from Heather a little bit later on about the consensus that fascism was aesthetically retrograde. So it raises the interesting question about the futurists, Marinetti, et cetera, uh, thoroughly kind of uh, in, in absorbed and immersed in Italian fascism, um, and yet part of a kind of an avant-garde movement that is, has its connections to Dadaism, to, to surrealism, and to many of the movements we've already touched upon. So um, aesthetics, art, creativity, chaos, the Vienna versus Berlin, you are happy for you to jump in on any one of those, or all of them. Charles and I are eyeing one another in the, <laughs> nervously. <laughs> uh, gosh, yes, creativity and chaos. Um, I, the Italian futurism one and the whole idea of modernism um, and the sort of aesthetically retrograde or aesthetically advanced uh, and then its relationship to fascism. For a long time, uh, modernism, certainly within kind of literary scholarship, and I'm talking about really pre-20th pre century, uh, pre-21st century rather, uh, was uh, seen to be deeply out of fashion for that very reason. So there's a huge body of scholarship, which is all about the relationship between fascism and modernism in all sorts of ways. Um, certainly there are figures too numerous to mention who um, whose work is set aside, you know, making space for other people's work to be explored. Um, and that, <clears throat> that the, the new modernist studies, as they're called, um, sort of around about the beginning of the 21st century, sort of revisited that and tried to sort of reconfigure modernism, you know, decolonize it, open up its boundaries, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It, and as a consequence of that kind of um, generated yet more debates about what modernism was. Um, <clears throat> So I think that idea that certain movements have got a character which is political one way or another, you can certainly say that's true. You can certainly say that's true of Marinetti's work. If you look about, if you look at other futurists like Boccione, somebody like that, uh, some of the painters, if you look at Russolo, uh, musicians, then you're not looking at somebody who's got that same aesthetic. Um, so yeah, I don't want to be an apologist for Marinetti in any way, shape or form, or for somebody like D'Annunzio, you know, who goes on to set up his own kind of little proto-fascist 
uh, republic or sort of state in fume. Um, so I, I think sometimes I think that, that the whole creativity and chaos thing is just to do with little power vacuums that open up in times of crisis and that creativity is always going on all, all around us. Um, and there are various mechanisms which make that creativity kind of, you know, suppress it or, or, or actually don't force people into the kind of corners that sometimes they need to be forced into in order to produce, uh, you know, the sort of publications, the sort of work, um, which actually then sometimes many years later finds its way into academic scholarship. Um, that probably isn't the case for music, but certainly thinking about, you know, I work on magazines and periodical culture. I can see a nice comment there from Ian. Um, I don't know about the periodical culture in Vienna. I think um, I think it will definitely have existed. And certainly there's a lively visual sort of caricatural culture. I do know a little bit about that. Um, but to me, that kind of improvisatory quality is the thing that chaos opens up rather than chaos itself being something which generates creativity. Um, and certainly if you're thinking about chaos in a sort of socio-political sense, then yeah, that can be deeply repressive for all sorts of groups of people for obvious reasons. Um, it can have the opposite effect for others. So, you know, there are, there are many examples of women uh, being placed in positions of authority they would never have been placed in, obviously, had it not been for various, war various wars. Uh, and although that doesn't magically open the doors of opportunity for them kind of after the war is a long ongoing struggle uh, for equality, then yes, it's inescapable that that, that affects change. So I think, yeah, there's, there's got to be a, a chaotic answer to the question about chaos, hasn't there? And that was mine. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, was, that, that, was, if that was chaos. That was quite, quite wonderfully crafted chaos. Uh, thank you, Faith. Um, Charles, I don't know whether you wanted to kind of think about this or perhaps even the Vienna Berlin quest, part of the question, but happy for you to, or keen to hear from you or, or, uh, on those kinds of questions. Well, 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 thank you, Richard. I mean, I guess my, uh, I, I'm reluctant to, to, to look for a transactional relationship between chaos and creativity, but it is, it, it, it is a fascinating idea. I, I suppose my, my own take on it um, is, is perhaps more to do with friction. And, and, and I, I wonder about the value that may be created from the friction of certain circumstances um, that might be a, the, the friction for an individual within society it might be the friction between um, between members of of, of, of of a group of people um, and or, or it, it, it might even be the friction um, between oneself and 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 you know one's one's kind of internal thought processes and 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 um uh and and kind of intellectual um I I intellectual kind of workings so so i to me that that is more more interesting uh, necessarily than the the um the, the the sort of external chaos which may seem to exist and indeed you know if you were to look at somewhere like if, if we were to think that, that that creativity should be produced from chaos, then you know one would look at somewhere like I guess Moscow in the 1980s, where where there was a good deal of chaos. But but I, I'm not aware of of a huge burst of creativity that results from that. But there, there may well be Russian scholars here who, who will correct me on that. But, but I'm sure we can all think of other examples of that. Um, and and in terms of Berlin. Yes, I mean, I think you know there, there have been periods during which perhaps Berlin has been has, may seem to have overtaken Vienna in, in in terms of what it had to offer. But the the other centre, you know, I guess during the during the twenties of of interest to to me would would have been Paris as well, and that that the the, the relationship between, um, I guess that the the the, the cultural political and economic circumstances in 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 Paris during the the 20s and and in Vienna um, at the same time would, would be an interesting one to to explore further um, but but I, I I'll stop there thank you uh, thank you Charles uh, very much and uh, and and thank you everybody uh, just to say we've got um, Faith briefly mentioned it but um, uh, our other colleague uh, Ian uh, has managed to sneak in with a well, a, 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 a longish question, which has a very nice little point in it, um, uh, which is, 
about the ways in which ideas are produced in all of these fields, in, in philosophy, in art, in literature, and, and, and throughout oh, Sarah. architecture, all, all of the kind of disciplines and fields we've been talking about. Um, Ian's picked up the, uh, the sense in which print is largely a mechanism for disseminating ideas, but the production of the ideas, and I think this is a really interesting uh, link to make across lots of the themes. I'm very happy for anybody to jump in on this one, really. Um, the, the production of ideas was in this period and in Vienna was particularly tied to face to face encounters. Well, there's references to coffee and cake and dinner and impromptu societies and circles, correspondence networks, for example. Um, and yeah, I, I want to open that up. He, he speculates that it doesn't sound like there might have been an influential pamphlet or newspaper culture, which is what um, uh, faith. Uh, uh, partly referred to, but I suppose we've, we've had a couple of mentions today. Arif earlier mentioned Karl Kraus, um, who's Die Fackel, which is, you know, the torch. The, 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 as far as I'm aware, the, 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 the paper that he wrote almost single-handedly, and funded by his father, I believe, um, in which he attacked everybody, irrespective. Um, I, I mentioned in my talk, he attacked Zweig as one of the elevators of culture, which is a delicious phrase, um, but he attacked everybody. Uh, uh, himself a Jew, Jew or, un, or, or, or not. Um, his targets were, I, I think as you were pointing out, Arif, were um, any form of, well, let's use the phrase you used earlier, was bullshit, but this idea of any sense of hypocrisy um, is, was, was what, he, what he aimed at. And I, I thought there's two things in there. So first is the face-to-face -face encounters. If, if anybody wanted to talk about why it might be that the, these small societies, groups, uh, communities, uh, societies uh, might be the production place of ideas, but uh, particularly if anybody's got any particular recommendations for Ian in terms of thinking about the kind of newspaper print culture in Vienna at the time as well. So I'm um, happy for any of you to grab the mic on this one. And then, and then I think we'll draw it to a conclusion. I guess one thing I'd say is I wouldn't I wouldn't want to um, comment too much on Karl Kraus, but just just with regards to the first point, I think in philosophy it's what Ian says is exactly right, and in a way it's not surprising that you get much more intellectual mileage and progress when you can actually talk to the people you know whose ideas you're engaging with, partly because then they're not dead but they're actually living and in front of you, and partly for the more prosaic reason that. That way, any misunderstandings can be quickly cleared up. Um, and so you get a much more productive engagement. And so for that reason, in philosophy, certainly there's no, there's no substitute for personal engagement. And of course, it was peculiar to this period. It happens in other periods as well. So, you know, a comparably fertile time in philosophy would have been, in philosophy and science, would have been England in the 17th century, you know, from where it was again, such a, such a culture, or indeed the Scottish Enlightenment in the, in the 18th century. Um, so, I suppose that he's quite right to point that out in the case of philosophy and the conversations the Vienna Circle has and they have with, with Wittgenstein. Um, and in a way, I find that not especially surprising because in philosophy, there is indeed no substitute for, for personal interaction. Thanks, Arif. Um, I think it's complicated in psychoanalysis, just so quickly. Yes, I mean, clearly, on, in one way, psychoanalysis is essentially dialogic. You know, so you need, you need another person there. Although Freud didn't, he, he, he did a self-analysis. He was the uh, originator. Uh, out of which all else flowed. But I think what uh, a couple of things to note about Freud, though, is that firstly, the coming together as a group is about advancing thinking, but it's also about building an organization, um, building building an organization in the small p political sense, you know, so that psychoanalysis could become structured and have an effect in the world. And you certainly need other people for that. And he was, you know, that's obviously why he was so keen on drawing Jungian, but also why he was so keen on the international dimension. And the third thing to stop off is, 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 is that for them, uh, starting a press, inventing journals, developing their own um, possibilities of expressing their ideas, challenge each other's ideas, certainly, but also disseminating them was really crucial. So they wouldn't have been happy. I mean, Freud was not happy to just stick with a group of people talking to one another. Absolutely put a lot of, 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 of energy early on into the development of psychoanalytic journals, some of which still exist today. Absolutely. No, thank you for those those points, Stephen and, and Arif, both of you, for interesting 
two points there about the both the the the, the um, need and the value of interpersonal communication, face-to-face -face encounters, conversations, the dialogic uh, um, encounter, as as you put it, Stephen. But also coming back to Ian's question, this crucial importance of dissemination, and, and of course that's partly why we're here. It, is oh, oh, what enables us to be here is because that dissemination of ideas as many of you have pointed out, the ways in which they change, they're adapted, they're, they're um, uh, altered through that very process. Um, so I, I, I'm aware very much, even more aware of the time now, because I was planning to end by about quarter past, it's now 18 minutes past. Um, uh, I'm, I think it remains simply for us to collectively, uh, everybody to open your microphones um, and to join me in thanking um, our speakers uh, today, all of those present, but also, of course, um, David, who uh, wasn't able to stay around for this final discussion. But uh, as I'm sure you'll agree with me, really stimulating uh, papers, discussions and some really rich ideas. Thank you all very much. And also yourselves, give yourselves a round of applause for some fantastic questions and being really engaged in these discussions. Thank you.